glad to see everybody here this evening. Glad that you know we didn't get stuck in traffic or or anything else that comes our way to distract us in the weeks. But uh, uh, we're uh, still in the prophets. We're still in the prophet Isaiah, and uh, I don't know how far we're going to get tonight. Um, and I realize this is very much the way Sarah teaches her Sunday school class. We'll get how far we get. I substituted on Sunday in Sarah's Sunday school class, and I said, "All right, we'll read." This, we'll read chapter five, and somebody said, the whole thing. <laughs> and I said, well, yeah, that was my plan. I said, wow, that's really something for Sarah's class. Yes. <laughs> like, oh, wow, I didn't know. <laughs> We've been doing better with Revelation than we have right. otherwise. Just sometimes surprise, sometimes so. we're lucky if we do a paragraph. <laughs> <laughs> um, tonight, I want to look at, uh, it's the first half of Isaiah. I don't know how far we'll get, but we're going to go up through 39 in this next little bit. And there are really three historical events that sort of provide us an anchor around the book of Isaiah. The truth is, there's two historical events, but the middle one to me is so funny, I like to mention it. It's not so much significant as just really funny. The other two, um, although, although I could argue it's pretty significant too, uh, but, the, but the two historical events really anchor the book of Isaiah, uh, the first, I should say, the first half of the book of Isaiah sort of set up the rest of it. And we're gonna talk a little bit about scripture. And we might even look at my Facebook page if we get there tonight, so. Mm -hmm. It's all connected. That's what you have to look forward to tonight. Is, uh, okay. That's what we call a tease. But the first thing I wanted to do was talk about the Syro Ephraimite crisis. Oh, yeah. And I knew everybody was wanting we wanted to do that. Too. When, when uh, would I get to the Syro Ephraimite crisis? Uh, well, it's, it's tonight. It's tonight. It took you long enough. <laughs> 735, uh, the Syro Ephraimite crisis took place. Now, I'm going to take a minute to explain what this is. Because the Bible does it in two verses, and I feel like it needs a little unpacking uh, to understand what's going on. Okay, um, there are four important program or players here in the program. We have King Ahaz, who is the king of Judah, whose capital is in Jerusalem. Okay, King Pekah, last name Boo. No, 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 no. I just made that up. That's just good job. King Pekah of Israel. So, <laughs> so he usually says, "Don't encourage him." That's usually the word that comes after him. Uh, Israel is sometimes represented by one of the large tribes in the north. You'll sometimes hear the nation of Israel referred to just as Ephraim. Um, it's one of those things where you can, you know, refer to, oh, it's, it's uh, what's, it, what's it called? Metonymy, I think, where you just use a part to represent the whole. Like, I can say Moscow when I mean Russia. I can say Washington when I mean the United States. I can say Ephraim when I mean the northern kingdom of Israel. So it's that idea. Uh, the capital is in Samaria. Had been ever since Amr. King Rezin of the country Aram, which is also called Syria, has their capital in Damascus. Now, these three countries are about the same size. About the same size army, about the same size gross national product, about the same number of people. They're roughly the same size. The major international superpower is led by King tiglath the III, who's uh, in Assyrian called Pulu, uh, but in the Bible is nicknamed as Pol, because I assume the Bible didn't want to write out Tiglath Pileser the uh, third, and so they just called him Pol, um, which I always used to joke was from the Akkadian word, which means to yank on something. Um, not really. That's also not true. Um, but anyway, Tiglath Pileser the third is the king of Assyria, a major military uh, leader. He was as successful and as I mean. He always won. He just marched across the width and breadth of the land and expanded Assyria and just always won. Okay, so those, those are the four players in the story. It goes like this. tiglath Pileser III is bringing the Assyrian army toward the western part of the Levant, toward Aram and Israel and, and um, Judah. Pika and Rezin know there's no way little bitty countries like them are going to be able to stand in his way. So the plan is to form a coalition, get all the countries to commit military forces together, and then they could oppose tiglath the III as a group. Ahaz, probably remembering the last time they tried this, King Uzziah was in charge then, and failed to, to beat them back, doesn't want any part of the battle. He doesn't want to join their little coalition of the willing here, okay? So Pika and Rezin decide, that they are going to attack Judah, take Ahaz off the throne, and put someone on the throne who will commit Judah's resources to repel tiglath the III's invasion. All right? So 
these guys want this guy to fight this guy, but this guy doesn't want to fight this guy, so these guys are going to get rid of this guy to put a guy on who will make all three guys fight this guy. Got it? Yes. Got it. Good. Okay. Questions or comments that far? Is this Cold War all over again? It's, it's just it's a mess. Who are we going to fight here? So we're good. We all understand the players. Like I said, the Bible does what I just did in two verses. So, okay. Well, let's look at what it does. In the days Ahaz, son of Jotham, son of Uzziah, king of Judah, king Rezin of Aram, and king Pekah, son of Remaliah of Israel, went up to attack Jerusalem, but could not mount an attack against it. When the house of David heard that Aram had allied itself with Ephraim, the heart of Ahaz and the heart of his people shook as the trees of the forest shake before the wind. It's interesting how much narrative material comes in Isaiah, surrounded by all of this poetic expression. You see, we did a lot of poetry up to now, <laughs> judgment on Israel, judgment on Judah, and now we get in some historical uh, stories here. The people are terrified, right? I mean, this, this is, they've got Assyria coming. That's bad enough. But now the people they would normally consider their allies have turned against them. So, so they're terrified. They're living in a time when they really feel like they have absolutely no allies in this setting. Okay? So what do you do? Well, God decides to offer a, a word of comfort to them. Then the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out and meet Ahaz, you and your son share Joshua at the end of the conduit of the upper pool on the highway to the fuller's field. Real quick, I told you that in the beginning of the book of Isaiah, there are some clues that, that it all should sort of be read as, as one book. Isaiah's son share Joshua. His name means a remnant shall return. So there's already foreshadowing of exile even in Isaiah's son's name here in the beginning of the book. So the book, does, like I said, it doesn't divide up as easy as people want to. Also, where they meet is significant. Okay, So I don't know if we're going to get to it tonight or if it's going to be the next time we come together, which won't be next week because of Thanksgiving, but, um, and it won't be the week after that, and it won't be the week. It'll be the 18th of December, I guess, the next time we come together. So um, it may be then before we find out why that's important. But remember the end of the conduit of the upper pool on the highway to the Fuller's Field. Or the washerman's field, as some translations have, because that's where they're meeting. All right? It's important later on. I, I try to highlight important plot points as you go through every now and then. That's an important plot point. And say to him, take heed, be quiet, do not fear, do not let your heart faint because of these two smoldering stumps of firebrand, because of the fierce anger of Rezin and Aram and the son of Remaliah. Because Aram, with Ephraim and the son of Remaliah, I love how we don't want to say Pika's name. We, and you know, the son of Remaliah. Whatever that is, uh, has plotted evil against you, saying, let's go up against Judah and cut off Jerusalem and conquer it for ourselves and make the son of Tabeel king in it. Therefore, thus the Lord says the Lord God, it shall not stand, it shall not come to pass. For the head of Aram is Damascus, the head of Damascus is resin. Within 65 years, Ephraim will be shattered, no longer the people. The head of Ephraim is Samaria, the head of Samaria is the son of Remaliah. If you don't stand firm in faith, you shall not stand at all. So, Isaiah says, hey, God wants you to know don't worry, and don't do anything. That's, that's the plan. <laughs> Just don't do anything. You've got the massive international Assyrian army marching toward you. You've got your two allies coming down to surround you. And God says, it's not going to be a problem. Just don't do anything. Well, that's, that's a pretty hard command, right? I mean, if you're facing down this military forces coming your way, the advice to just don't do anything is going to be hard to take. So, God, I think, understands this is a word that's going to be hard to take, even though Isaiah is a true prophet and we should be listening to Isaiah. God offers Ahaz what we all wish that we could have. I mean, it is, it is the greatest thing ever. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign of the Lord your God, let it be deep as Sheol, as high as heaven. This is the greatest thing ever. Because he says to Ahaz, Ask for a sign. Remember we talked about prophets. Signs are things that confirm the prophetic word. Signs are things that prove the prophet's telling the truth. Let it be deep as Sheol or high as heaven. Anything you want. Blank check. God will do it. You want the sky to be green? You want the grass to be blue? Whatever it is, God will do it to prove to you this is a good idea to listen to. So what does Ahaz do? He gives an answer that sounds like a pretty good answer. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, I will not put the Lord to the test. On the surface, that sounds like it's a good answer. Let me translate it for you in the spirit of the text, which is, doesn't really, I don't really need it, I don't plan on doing what God says anyway. That's what I will not put the Lord to the test means. I'm not <coughs> waiting to find out if God is actually telling the truth on this. I have absolutely no intention to do what God is asking me to do. No chance. So, 
Isaiah said. And, and Isaiah took it that way too. You see it instantly. Isaiah said, Here then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary mortals that you weary my God also? You've made everyone mad, and now you're making God mad. You've made everyone on earth angry at you. They're all bringing their armies against you, and now you've decided to add God to that list. Good plan. It's a really good plan to have. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a son. Look, the young woman is with child and shall bear a son and shall name him Emmanuel. That is so familiar. I know. I have heard that somewhere before. We'll get to that. He shall eat curds and honey by the time he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the child knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land before whose two kings you are in dread will be deserted. The Lord will bring on you and on your people and on your ancestral house such days as have not come since the day Ephraim departed from Judah the king of Assyria. On that day, the Lord will whistle for the fly that is the sources of the streams of Egypt and for the bee that is in the land of Assyria. They will all come and settle in the deep ravines and the clefts of the rocks and all the thorn bushes and in all the pastures. So bad things are coming as a result of this choice, Ahaz. So, so let's stop there for a second. How you doing? Yes. Yes, Steve. I'm confused. Okay. Who is not going to do anything? A God wants Ahaz to not do anything. He's the one up north and then one. He's the one in the south. He's the southern king of Egypt. The northern king of Israel and and Syria both want to form a coalition to fight Taylor. Okay, but he's the northern king. I thought the northern king was Judah. No, no, no. Northern God is suggesting that Judah just do their wallpaper impression and pretend they're not there. So, yeah. The fly of Egypt and the uh, the bee of the Assyria. The bee of Assyria. Are those uh, idiomatics or something? They just just. I think plague that is coming. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Bad times are coming. Plague. Yeah. Yeah. So, so <coughs> how are we doing? So this this uh, statement about the uh, the she'll bear a son. Yes. And name him Emmanuel. Yes. This is the first time that appears. Right? This is it. Yeah. Is this, this, is the is, this, this is the only. This, this is, is the, the only, only Old Testament time. occurrence of that. Yeah. It is the only. Yeah. Oh. It Matthew picks up on it later yeah. on. Yeah. Right. Yeah. All right. But. We'll talk, don't worry, I won't get I won't get away from that. That I'll do tonight, I promise. Yeah, won't get away from that. Go ahead, we have Nancy first. Mine's easy. Can you go back to the screen you had with the kings? Oh, way back to the beginning? Well, yeah, just where we thought that. That there? Right there. Okay. So Ahaz is really in the south. Ahaz is in the south. Okay. Peak is in the north, and Resin is a little further northeast than that. <laughs> All these roughly the same size. This is the big man. Who's coming? And he's in the north. He's in the east, and he's going to swoop down from the northeast. He's basically conquering his way through Babylon, uh, the Aram Naharaim, down into Syria, and down into Israel and Judah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Be the fertile crescent is the crescent. So I'm, I'm doing it this way. I should be doing it this way. I'm sorry. I'm doing it relative That's to me. Yeah. Thanks. So, after this sign, we get a second sign, which has in it my very favorite Old Testament name. Then the Lord said to me, take a large tablet and write on it in the common characters belonging to Maharshal Hashbaz. The great name, Maharshal Hashbaz. I want to preach on this text just to make some deacon read the words Maharshal Hashbaz. That probably needs redeeming. I probably yeah. can't do that. Uh, and have it attested for me by reliable witnesses, the priest Uriah and Zechariah, son of Jeberechiah, which is also pretty good. Um, and I went to the prophetess, and she conceived and bore a son. And the Lord said to me, Name him Maharshal Hashbaz. For before the child knows how to call my father or my mother, the wealth of Damascus and the spoil of Samaria shall be carried away by the king of Assyria. So God says, Write down Maharshal Hashbaz. And I went, and I had relations with the prophetess, which in this case I think simply means Mrs. Prophet. Um, in other words, Isaiah's wife. <laughs> and uh, she conceives and bears a son, and the Lord names him, has him name him Mahar Shal Hashbaz. Mahar Shal Hashbaz means uh, the spoil quickens, the plunderer hastens. But if you want to know basically the idiomatic translation of that, it's a squirrel in front of a car. <laughs> um, you know how when the squirrel runs out into the street and then it sees the car? And if the squirrel would have just kept running, it would have been fine. But then it sees the car and just loses its mind, and then you end up driving over the squirrel? You know, that's basically what we're naming Mahar Shal Hashba. That, that's what that means. It basically means um, Assyria is coming and Ahaz freaks out. 
Ahaz is the squirrel and Assyria is the car. That's what Maharshal Hashbaz means, is that the minute you come under anxiety, you, you panic. Um, that's, that's the minute. So, the Lord spoke to me again, because this people has refused the waters of Shiloh that flow gently and melt in fear before Rezin and the son of Remaliah, whoever that guy is. Therefore, the Lord is bringing up against it a mighty flood waters of the river. The king of Assyria, all his glory, will rise above its channels, overflow its banks, sweep on into Judah as a flood, pouring over it will reach up to the neck, and its outspread wings will fill the breadth of the land, O Emmanuel. Band together, you peoples, be dismayed. Listen, all you far countries. Gird yourselves and be dismayed. Gird yourselves and be dismayed. I thought you just said that. Take counsel together, but it shall not be brought to naught. Speak a word, but it will not stand, for God is with us. So what thoughts do you have as you see Emmanuel here? What if we don't want God so with us? Yes, this is, <laughs> that this is so the point great. I make about Isaiah. Emmanuel in Isaiah is not a good thing. Mm -hmm. It's not a fluffy, happy Emmanuel in Isaiah. This, this is God with you like the teacher is with you while you're taking the test. This is God standing right with you. Uh, and you don't get to get away with anything because God is with you. So notice that the Maharshal Hashbaz connection to Emmanuel in both places. This is Emmanuel also, God with us here. So, oh, God with us. You can translate it. You can leave it untranslated. I, I, I'm curious always when translations don't aren't consistent because you could have done it here too. This is the name. Could have gone either way. But God is with us. But during this whole crisis in 735, somebody's got time to get frozen with the kids. So this is a slow motion. Well, yes. I mean, the army's coming. Yeah. This is a building of tension. It is. Not the first thing that shows up on the horizon. So correct. He's saying, like, before the kid even like knows right from wrong, this is going to happen. So I think it's more like this is in need. This is relatively soon, yeah. 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 Um, for the Lord spoke thus to me while his hand was strong upon me and warned me not to walk in the way of this people, saying, Do not call conspiracy all that this people calls conspiracy. Do not fear what it fears, or be in dread. But the Lord of hosts, him you shall regard as holy. Let him be your fear. Let him be your dread. He will become a sanctuary, a stone one strikes against. For both houses of Israel, he will become a rock one stumbles over, a trap and a snare for the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many among them shall stumble. They shall fall and be broken. They shall be snared and taken. So God said, God said Isaiah said, God came to me and said, don't believe what they're calling conspiracy. Don't believe what they say is wrong. You trust in God on this one. The majority of the people are going to be wrong on this. So we've gotten two signs to Ahaz. The sign of Emmanuel, which is before the child knows right from wrong, the land before the two kings you are now in dread will be forsaken. And the sign of Maharshal Hashbaz, which is before he can say, my mother, my father. Uh, the wealth of Damascus and the spoils of Samaria shall be carried away. This is happening in 735. Traditional Jewish age of accountability, 13. We subtract because we're in BC, giving us 722. And of course, Three years to say my mother, my father, roughly. Uh, it's easier in Hebrew, so you might get away with it at two years old. But I think that three is a pretty good year because it makes the numbers round out nice. Um, so 732 uh, there. So by 722, the two lands are destroyed. By, by 732, they've got no money. Those are the two signs that Isaiah gives to Ahaz. And that's what happens. Yes. <laughs> Tiglath believes the third campaigns. In 733, he reduces Israel to just Samaria. I mean, he just basically destroys the whole country down to just the capital city. The only reason he let the capital city stand was because they emptied the temple treasury and the palace treasury and bought him off and promised to be a loyal vassal. Uh, in 732, Damascus was destroyed so much that it couldn't even stand as an independent area and was annexed as an Assyrian province, and a governor was appointed uh, on top of that. Uh, Judah, however, King Ahaz, decides to appeal to the Assyrians and promise to be a loyal vassal. So instead of doing nothing, he just surrenders uh, to save his, save his hide. Um, most Old Testament textbooks will tell you that this, in truth, probably saved their lives. They probably would have been just wiped out and destroyed. Um, my argument is always, we don't know what would have happened had they done nothing. I mean, they had been ignored in the past. God said, do nothing. Maybe Assyria would have ignored them and everything would have been fine. We don't know. Uh, but instead, Ahaz and Judah become an Assyrian vassal. They accept uh, tribute, they, or they pay tribute, they accept military uh, occupation, they accept Assyrian gods in the temple, they do, I mean, all the things that a loyal vassal has to do. And, uh, and so it's, as a result, protected from destruction. In 727, Tiglath-Pileser dies, 
Uh, Israel, encouraged by Egypt, withholds tribute from Assyria. This, by the way, is going to be a recurring theme. Uh, up until about oh, the 13th century BC, Israel, excuse me, Egypt had the best, they, they were great. They, they could win a game on the road, they could win a game at home. They were, they were great anywhere they played. After the 13th century BC, Israel, Egypt still had a great home game, but they could not win a game on the road to save their lives. Once Egypt got across the Sinai, they never won. If you want to know, after the 13th century, who won a battle, see which side Egypt was on. And I promise you that side lost. Um, you're going to see that it's so common that it actually becomes a joke in the Bible. Egypt becomes a joke in the Bible about this. Um, but they always encouraged you know, Judah and Israel to, to rebel because if, they, if they're successful, they get a nice buffer zone to the rest of the, the, the Near East. Uh, whoever controls Israel controls the only land bridge between Africa and Asia. And so they want that land bridge. They want that buffer. So they're always encouraging. And they held out pretty well. They withhold tribute. Um, Assyria besieges Samaria for three years, which is a long siege. But they finally lost. They always lost. Assyria always won. And in 722, Samaria falls. The people are deported by Sargon II. Judah is the only nation left. And I imagine Isaiah sent Ahaz a bar mitzvah card for Maharshal Hashbaz. That's just my guess, um, as a reminder that this is exactly what God said was going to happen. So, so I told you a lot of history tonight to make sense of what's going on in this text. Well, so with the way Ahaz, Ahaz said, well, I, my approach was just as good as God's, right? Yeah, probably. Yeah, that's probably what he figured. Of course, he loses now a ton of wealth. He has to accept military occupation. There are some costs that come with it. So. But they survive. God's not real fond about it, put it that way. Now, in the story I just told you, we read, Behold, a young woman is with child in 714, and, and it does seem pretty clear to me that that passage had a very real, immediate application for Ahaz. I mean, the numbers just added right up. I mean, it does seem that Isaiah 714 is talking about something that's going to occur in Isaiah's lifetime and Ahaz's lifetime. Um, I don't think that means Matthew is wrong when he uses it to describe Jesus. I, I said before that prophets always have a message that has an immediate concern for them, but that sometimes those prophecies can have like a dual fulfillment at the same time. So the best way I know to explain this when I talk about Matthew's use of, actually when I talk about any New Testament use of an Old Testament text, the best way I know to explain this is to talk about memes. But since this audience is not primarily 18 to 22, um, I might need to give you a little more about that, okay? Some of you might be familiar with meme culture that we have. Um, usually a clip from a movie, uh, a gif from a movie, something like that to try to explain, uh, to, to make some joke. People send it in phones. Um, the boys and I have had a run, an ongoing meme uh, text conversation since Daniel was in sixth grade. Um, Thomas has like a thousand of them on his phone now because he's saved them over time. Um, I, I asked, this was for an exercise for a class about two years ago. I, on Facebook, posted, this is for a class, post a meme or a GIF that describes what you think about me. Now, there's a good chance that Bob Wallace has already seen this, and the only reason I say that is because while he was on the Pastor Search Committee, at one point in the interview process, Bob opened the question with, so eight years ago on a blog, you wrote, no. and I thought, oh, okay, so this is, this is the way this interview is going to go. Um, so what happens when the CIA is on your pastor's search committee? Um, but if you haven't seen it, uh, let me really quickly show the toolbar here. There we go. All right, here's what it looks like. Um, so I said, this is a serious request for the purpose of this class exercise. Please comment on the status describing using only a GIF. Some of them use GIFs, some of them use me. GIFs are animated. Um, my best friend from college posted uh, The Princess Bride. Some of you may recognize this movie. If you keep using that word, I do not think it means what you think it means. Um, <laughs> Ashley Bowers, <laughs> a friend of mine, uses, uh, posts a deep Star Trek Deep Space Nine quote. That's very moving, except for one small problem that never happened. Um, Cheryl Frankowski posted a creepy Mr. Rogers GIF. I still been a little weirded out by Mr. Rogers in the clown mask, I'm not gonna lie. Um, I have one student who had a Simon Cowell brilliant quote, that's a good one. 
Um, I'm not real sure what Millhouse, uh, what that would mean. Um, <laughs> um, you know, some of these are very confusing. It means more about Nick. Than it does say more about Nick than it does me. Jonathan Brooks was a uh, student that I taught in the west side of Chicago for a class I taught down uh, down there in the city. And uh, this picture, ooh, the Bible, is the, is the quote that he has here. Um, and so I think Cindy, you had, where was it? I think Cindy's is on here too. She had a laughing Sheldon as a picture for me. Oh yeah, I think I did. Um, <laughs> some of these you can see are just ridiculous. Um, settlers of Catan board made out of cupcakes. Oh, Believe it or not, there's a that. depth of meaning to that that it's hard for me yes. to go into at this time. Um, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> so you can see what these students thought of me. I think you get a good picture here. <laughs> Of who I am. There it is. It's Cindy, you picked yeah, me laughing, right. Sheldon. Um, oh. I'm a bear in one of them. I don't quite get that one either. So. I like between numbers one and two. Yeah. <laughs> so. Colin <laughs> Mark. Um, all right. So, what is my point of doing all of this? I'm sure is the question that is coming to your mind. Comic Be relief. No, no. Believe it or not, <laughs> I actually have a, 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 a pedagogical point to make here. No one complained on there when duplicate movies were used. No one complains when they were out of context. No one complains they disrespected the movie or the original clip. No one complains that I wasn't using the, the you know, someone shouldn't use that movie, I already used that movie, um, or, or to use two, the same movie to make two different points. When you looked at that, the question was always, does that really work here? Does it actually express who I am on some level? And some of them depend a lot on inside knowledge. I mean, the reason that that was a settler of Catan cupcake board, I'll let you in on this one, was I was doing a wedding for Andy the night before, and at his bachelor party, I was the only one who wasn't drinking. And so <laughs> I took that opportunity to ask Andy, so is there anything that you would like me, they were playing Settlers of Catan while drinking, I said, anything you'd like me to mention in the service tomorrow? Um, at which point Andy said, yeah, yeah, I want you to mention sticks and rocks and bricks. Um, I said, all right. And so the next day during the service, I say during the homily in the wedding, that you know, we all wish for you a home, not simply a house made of sticks or rocks or bricks, but actually a home, right? When I do that, all the groomsmen just about lose it. And Andy, nobody else caught it at any point. I said, look, you don't mess with me on this. I can do this, you know, I'm a professional. <laughs> but that's why he picks that. Well, that takes a little inside knowledge, right? That to show that that makes any sense. And when I looked at that, I thought, okay, that's a really clever, that's a really clever gift. Here's the thing. That's how Old Testament quotes work in the New Testament. They are not working in the sense of proving, they're working in the sense of supporting, okay? So when Matthew comes along and says, all this took place to fulfill what had been spoken to the Lord through the prophet, look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Matthew is quoting the Greek translation of the scripture. The Greek translation of the scripture has virgin in Hebrew, parthos, and it also has the future tense. In the Hebrew, it is simply young woman, which you know, young woman can be a virgin, doesn't have to be, just a woman of marrying age is all the Hebrew means. And it is the natural sense of it is more present, is. But when the Greek was translated, it made it to look more like this. So the NRSV has what is the more literal translation of the Hebrew. The NIV has the more literal translation of the Greek because they don't want you to miss Jesus. There's two different translation philosophies in two different Bibles, okay? Matthew, what, what I always say, we'll come back to the slide, but what I always try to remind folks is Matthew's making his case that Jesus is the Messiah. He's using evidence that his audience understands, so his use of scripture is different than the way we would use scripture. This doesn't make Matthew wrong, it doesn't make us right, it just means that each of us would have had a very hard time making the point to the other person's audience. They would not have understood the way I deal with scripture and trying to keep it in the original context and understand how it was heard, but at the same time, I have a hard time with what Matthew is doing because I would consider that taking it out of context. But that's not, that's what rabbis did. That's what Paul did. That's what Matthew did. That's what all the first century rabbis did. So all of that to say, this is what's going on in the New Testament all the time. So when you see an Old Testament quote in the New Testament, they're using it to support their argument more than they're using it to prove the way we think of proof, right? It's, it, this is a, they're, they're making a case, all right? That's my exposition on that. <laughs> Does that help? Does that cause anyone's heartburn? Can I help you with this? Are you troubled by that? Well, the point is, these are Jews who know the Hebrew Bible right. better than we know the Old Testament. 
Correct. And, and the way that, they, and they understood the way their audience would hear a point supported. Right. I mean, Matt, or Paul uses Abraham to support that salvation comes by grace and not the law to his audience because, first of all, they considered themselves child of Abraham, and that's before the law had come. And, they, and so you either say that Abraham was unrighteous, which you can't make them. So again, he's, he's using his audience, like using scripture to make his point to his audience. His audience would never go, that's not what it meant in the original context. His audience would have went, ooh, that's a good point. Okay, I'm going to have to make my point now. And then they would use Abraham to go the other way. I mean, that's that's just what you would do. In the same way that you'd get four different quotes from the Princess Bride on my on my Facebook comment because they know I love the Princess Bride. So, you all seem to be totally cool with this. I I always have more trouble with this than than Uh, as as a resident millennial. Your analogy checks out. Okay, thank you. (laughs) Thank you, Tom. Thank you. It goes a long way, I know, with this crowd. So, well, as one who grew up uh, not in uh, this era, uh, your argument would then tend to undercut the. Uh, people who use the scripture to say, well, you know, the prophecies came became came true. Right. There, therefore, the scriptures are. It would undermine true. that way of reading the prophets. Yes. And it, I yes, because I the prophetic text in the Old Testament. That that's not the way prophecy worked for them. They prophecy for them spoke to their time period. Now mm-hmm. it came to have later fulfillments. Sure, and I think, but but I don't think, I don't think the words were spoken. I don't think Isaiah said to Ahaz, by the time Jesus is 13, that land will be gone. That's not his point. His point is by the time this child will be 13, you know, that land will be gone. That's something you're going to see happen in your lifetime. You should have listened to me. Yeah, absolutely. Here's the question that has always troubled me, though. Let's, let's say I would, so I'll just welcome you into my trouble now. Because the misery loves company. If I was commissioned to translate a Bible, this, as I said, the more literal Hebrew text. But this is so you don't miss Jesus. So what should you do? So if you were asked to translate a Bible, which do you pick? Because you're going to have to make a choice. For you, you would go here. You have to go as yeah. far upstream as possible. And then once you get to the spring where the river comes out, you have to look around at the terrain and see the context of the spring. Okay. That, you got me deep in the metaphor there. But yeah, go ahead, Doug. You lost me. <laughs> He's still in the spring. Go ahead. Not to know the context of the original. Not yeah. just yeah, find the original. Okay. And then find okay. everything about Good. the context. Good. Tyler? Yeah, I would use footnotes. You want to do here too? I want to do NRSV with a Matthew 22, 23 footnote that says see Isaiah 714. Okay. But, okay, so here's my question. Assuming my audience only speaks English. I was going to say, or my audience only speaks English, and let's assume they don't have a pastor who has a PhD in Old Testament as an accomplished teacher as I am. <laughs> Which is a Sorry. fairly safe guess. <laughs> the long I didn't mean to spit at you. You did spit at you. I did spit at you. We'll wash out. Anyway, they read Matthew 22, 1 22, and it says, A virgin shall conceive. And you have your footnote that says, See Isaiah 7 14. And it comes here and it says, Young woman is with child. Because what, what do you do with that? Extended footnote. Extended footnote. Explain, explain <laughs> really long footnote, footnote that yes. explains yes. all of this. See, here's the, here's the trouble. All of our Old Testament originally is in Hebrew. All of our New Testament quotes are using a Bible in Greek. They're using the translation of the Old Testament. This is why your new Old Testament quotes in the New Testament don't look quite like your Old Testament quotes, because if you've got that double translation thing going on in the New Testament. And, but again, at the risk of committing heresy in a Baptist church, I, the, the, uh, the Immaculate Conception has never been a cornerstone of my faith. Okay. Well, the Immaculate Conception is the term that applies to Mary being it born. Does. Yeah. It does. But, but, it did, but I understood, what he, going, I, I understood what he was going for there. The, 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 the virginal conception of Mary, but for me, the virginal conception of Mary aside, I want to understand Matthew's point. And would that lead people astray or, or not? I mean, obviously there are more Bibles have chosen this route than that route. In fact, when the Revised Standard Version came out in the 1950s and it had young woman, um, it was it was labeled a liberal Bible. It was mm-hmm. burned in a pulpit, the ashes of which were sent to eventually Bruce Metzger, head of the NRSV translation committee, had them on his shelf. He just died a few years ago, and I wonder what happened to the ashes mm-hmm. of that Bible up there. Um, it was published with a red cover in the 1950s. It is obviously a communist plot to subvert religion in America. 
What's your inflation? What? Oh, up? That's obvious. Yeah. I mean, doesn't say virgin and it was red. What more do you have to say? Okay. Pretty clear, Cindy. I don't want to miss it there. But. So, I mean, this is a big issue for people. It's been re met with a resounding meh in this group, but it's a huge issue. Yeah. <laughs> Peterson goes with the black. He does. He goes down here too. Yeah. He does. <laughs> So does King James. So does the King James. So does the NIV. So does the NASV. So does the ESV. So does the HCSV. So I mean, never CEV, CEV, all of them down here. Um, New Revised Standard. <laughs> Interesting enough, the Jewish Publication Society goes with Young Woman. Uh, probably just a coincidence. The original oh. birth is not nearly as problematic as the resurrection. Yeah, well, <laughs> agreed. Agreed. Um, but but for me, it's always been an issue of helping people understand it. Here's an interesting thing. The, the Coptic Orthodox get around this completely. Coptic Orthodox Christians say, oh yeah, the Hebrew is the original. There's no question, Hebrew was the original text, but the early church used the Septuagint. So that's the official church, that's the official Old Testament for the church. So therefore, you translate the Old Testament, it would say virgin, you send it to Septuagint, it's gonna say virgin, everything will match up, all our verses will match up, no problem. Logically consistent, everything's fine. We, we, we do things a lot more messy in evangelical and other circles, so yeah. But it's, it's just an interesting, Conversation to me about what's, what the choices are. Yeah, go ahead. No, that's that's amazing. I mean, this this is also less of an issue for me because there there are worse things that you have to reconcile. Like, what what was the day that Jesus died? Oh, According right. to John versus the Synoptics. Yeah, but that's that's like, not how a big did Judas me. how did Judas die? John's John's. Uh, I love my colleague Mike, my you know, my podcast partner Mike's, uh, and his title of John course is John the Synoptics' tricky friend. Uh, so it's really not that complicated. He's, he's being provocative. So that one's not as hard. But yeah, but yeah this is. I like the Greek answer though. Like yeah, I like that. Exactly. The comics are completely logical. The best part about this is um, I was teaching the class, it had a Coptic student in it, and uh, I was telling the story and all this, and she said, Oh, well, the Simeon story. And I said, I'm sorry? And she goes, Simeon, the translator, Simeon. And I said, I'm sorry, Aunt Christine, I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. And she didn't quite have the English that she needed, I think, and you know, she's Egyptian, and so, so she comes back and she hands me the story the next day. There's a Coptic tradition that the Simeon who is in the temple that receives Jesus with Anna is the Simeon who 200 years before was a member of the translation team for the Septuagint. And his job was Isaiah 7. And he said to God, God, it says young woman. It doesn't say virgin. And God said, if you translate it as virgin, you will live to see the Messiah. So he showed faith, and he translated it as virgin, and lives another 250 years, and gets to see Jesus in the temple, and now he can depart in peace. Well, I like that story. Isn't that a better. nice story? Yes. <laughs> that's a nice story. I mean, that's that's great. But, uh, so yeah, so that's a, that's a sweet story that explains the translation differently. But anyway. So this is one of those things... For some reason, this is one of those things people who love their atheism are always proud to bring up to me and are surprised I know. It's like, yeah, I'm completely aware of this issue, and yes, I'm still a Christian. I mean, they, they, somehow this is, oh, well, well, you got me there. <laughs> go, no, I know this. Thanks. Um, go ahead. Okay. All right. Well, that's, that's fun. You guys are easy. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> you're going to be trying to figure out your notes later, though, when you wrote Old Testament quotes and memes. <laughs> no idea what that means. <laughs> All right, King Hezekiah. Hezekiah takes the throne after Ahaz in 715 BC. Uh, he is one of the two good kings in Judah without condition. In other words, you had some kings who were good except. You know, you had a king like Uzziah, who was good except he let the high places continue. Or he was good except the, the you know, he offered incense in the temple. He was good except this. Hezekiah is good. Josiah is good. Hezekiah is good. There are only two you get in the Old Testament. Um, he actually limits sacrifice to Jerusalem. You no longer can sacrifice in the high places anymore, which is a big deal. I mean, these are local places. Asking people to travel 200 miles to offer sacrifice wasn't real popular, especially when their parents had been using this mountain for years. I mean, imagine, you know, look, my grandfather sacrificed here, my great-grandfather sacrificed here, now you want me to go to Jerusalem? Boop, right. You finally got rid of the high places. You finally able to do that. Um, in 712, cities along the coast of the old Philistine plain rebelled against Assyria. And Hezekiah is tempted to join them because you know, you've been an Assyrian vassal now for, for 15, 10 years. You've been giving them part of your gross national product. You've been fighting through that for a long time. You'd like to get rid of that, that situation. So um, 
and he wants to join. Hezekiah, Isaiah tells him no. This is how Isaiah tells him no. In chapter 20, verse 1. In the year the commander-in-chief who was sent by King Sargon of Assyria came to Ashdod, fought against it, and took it. At the time, the Lord had spoken to Isaiah, son of Amos, saying, Go, loose the sackcloth from your loins, take the sandals off your feet, and he had done so, walking naked and barefoot. Then the Lord said, Just as my servant Isaiah has walked naked and barefoot for three years as a sign and portent against Egypt and Ethiopia, so shall the king of Assyria lead away Egyptians and captives of Ethiopians as exiles, young and old, naked and barefoot, with buttocks uncovered to the shame of Egypt. And they shall be dismayed and confounded because of Ethiopia, their hope, and of Egypt, their boast. And that day the inhabitants of this coastland will say, See, this is what happened to those in whom we hoped, and whom we fled for help and deliverance from the king of Assyria. And we, how shall we escape? Isaiah preaches to, Isaiah, to, to Hezekiah and says, If you join this rebellion, you will end up like me, naked and barefoot and led off into captivity. This, on my, for my money, is at least the second most creative sermon illustration in the entire Bible, <laughs> preaching naked for three years, number one for me would have to be marrying a prostitute. I mean, that's, that's being committed to the sermon as well, I think. <laughs> um, three years he preaches naked. And, and guess what? It worked! He didn't do what Isaiah told him not to do. So, happy ending. Um, one of those times the prophet says don't, and he didn't. I just like to throw that story in there because it always makes me laugh. And nobody ever remembers Isaiah preached naked for three years. You know, that kind of makes me laugh. Yeah, students always right. ask, did he, was that just at work? Did he dress at home? I, I don't know the answer to that question. Well, I'm off to work. I mean, I have no <laughs> idea how that went. I had a wife and kids. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yes, he did. I mean, it's one of those, God asked me to do this, I asked for ID. But Isaiah, completely all, he's all in. He's preaching naked for three years. Again, why you don't want your daughter marrying a prophet? We've gone over this. Uh, end up with symbolic kid names, and he's going to work naked. So, yeah. Yeah, we, do I recall correctly that there was another prophet that walked around naked, or not? This is the one I know of. I don't remember. No, you, that. you didn't mention another. I don't think, no, that no, was Isaiah. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I did mention Isaiah in the sermon once, though. So, yeah, I just made it in passing and gave the Isaiah twenty reference and knew everybody would go to it. Mm-hmm. Stop listening. Well, let's get the invasion of Sennacherib. This is going to work out okay. Uh, Sennacherib comes on the throne in 705. Sargon II died unexpectedly, uh, which of course is a sign of weakness. I believe he was on the battlefield when it happened. Uh, His son Sennacherib comes on the throne, and he ascends the throne amid revolts. The entire Assyrian Empire decided to revolt, because anytime you have a change in leadership, that's when you see, that's the best time to to try and change things. That doesn't matter if you're in a church, or an empire. Always happens. So that's to try, to try to get your attention. So Sennacherib has to literally fight his way. So imagine Assyria on the eastern edge of the Fertile Crescent, and everybody down to Judah at the far western edge of the empire is revolting. So Sennacherib's going to have to fight his way all the way through the empire to retake. This is the perfect time, because any one of those moments could stop him, and this is when you can actually, you know, get some freedom. So Hezekiah decides to rebel. And he has some time. Because he's the far western edge, he can make some, he can make some um, preparations. So he digs a tunnel to bring water inside the city. We're going to see that in a second. He strengthened and built a new wall. And he fortified 46 additional cities in addition to Jerusalem. Unfortunately, in 701, Sennacherib showed up. Four years, nothing stopped him. He walked right across <laughs> <laughs> the Fertile Crescent, reconquered everything as he went. But I want to look at some of his preparations. This is a, a rendering of the Temple Mount. Um, down here you see the city of David. Uh, the temple's up here. Uh, this is where the uh, Gahom Spring is. Now, unfortunately, this is where the wall is. So the spring is literally outside the wall. So if you want to have any water during a siege... How do you protect it? People had tried different things, digging down and digging over and putting it around. Hezekiah had a group over here and a group over here start digging to each other. Now, the assumption is they were following a natural crack because I don't think you just start digging under the hill and hope you run into each other. I think you need a plan. Um, And actually, this group over here only made it about this far versus this group over here. So I think that either these guys were much lazier 
uh, or they were, it hadn't eroded as much as this side has. It just went down. And this side was coming in a little high, and so there's just one part in the tunnel where you get a lot of headroom um, as you're walking through. So they covered it up out here. Now there's the keen observer of you will notice that all that does is put the water on the outside of the wall on the other side of the hill. But Hezekiah expanded a wall across the valley and up to encompass some of these settlements that most archaeologists assume were founded when the northern kingdom fell. So the refugees from the northern kingdom came south, many of them settled on this hill, and he built a wall around the hill because it was easier to defend this, this, side, of the, this side of the city than this side of the city. So that was the plan. Of course, what would a conversation about this be without pictures of the tunnel? Uh, here's the cone spring, um, and here is the tunnel. Um, as all of us going through there, I still love the joy on Becca's face, and I still don't know what Laura stepped in. Um, but either of those is great. But what's amazing is you actually have from Isaiah quotes dealing with these preparations. Isaiah 22, 11 says, You made a reservoir between the two walls, for the water of the old pool, but you did not look to him who did it or have regard for him who planned it long ago. Um, you can actually see the pick marks on the wall as you go through, and they actually change direction where they meet, uh, which is how you can tell where they met, uh, which wow. is kind of cool. The, wow. the commemorative plaque that commemorates this is located in, uh, actually in Jordan, uh, because it was taken there uh, before 1948, so FYI. And this is his pool. This is the pool it came to. That's a modern sewer pipe. That's not what it was. Uh, this is not part Impressive. of that. This is, this is uh, the actual pool that was unearthed that belonged to Hezekiah. Uh, here is Hezekiah's wall around the city that went across. This is around Jerusalem. Uh, you can actually see it's about five meters thick and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight meters tall. It was huge. It was a huge wall. Um, but what's significant about this extra wall that he built is this right here. You know, it's, it's amazing when you see resonance with the archaeology and the Bible. And I don't think there is a better example than this scene. Now, I'm going to, the next slide, I'm standing right here taking a picture down. You can literally see the foundations of a house with the wall going right through it. Isaiah says in verse 22, 10, you counted the houses of Jerusalem and broke down the houses to fortify your wall. There is literally archaeological evidence for that verse in Isaiah of him using one of the early examples of eminent domain and running right through the living room of some poor Jerusalem house to, to, to fortify the wall here, which I just find fascinating. He does that. It's really pretty cool. So. What's the name of the pool again? Siloam. Yeah. Same, same as in the New Testament? Same as in the New Testament. Well, Sennacherib defeats the Egyptian army that was under Takara and ravages Judah. He takes 46 cities, including Lachish, which, by the way, are the most famous uh, Assyrian uh, uh, bas-reliefs there in the British Museum. You may have even seen them. They've got the siege machines and, and depictions of them all throughout that. Uh, the Assyrian record is on the Taylor Prism, which I was desperately trying to think of the other day when Tyler and, and Steve and I were talking. This is a picture of the Taylor Prism, which is located in the Oriental Institute in Chicago. Uh, where Sydney has seen mm -hmm. the Taylor Prism. Uh, this is about actual size, actually, <laughs> which describes this from the Assyrian perspective. Um, and uh, so surrounding the city, how are we doing? Yeah, I can do this. Surrounding the city, it says, in the 14th year of King Hezekiah, King Sennacher of Assyria came against all the fortified cities of Judah and captured them. I said to you there were 46. I know there are 46 because the Assyrians told us there were 46. The Bible just says all, but that provides us a little context there. The king of Assyria sent the Rob Shockey, which was my nickname on the archaeological excavation in 1993, by the way, uh, from Lachish to King Hezekiah at Jerusalem. With the great army, he stood on the conduit of the upper pool on the highway to the Fuller's Field. Did you guys miss that location at all? Anything? Yeah, yeah, the Washerman's Field, yes. That's where Isaiah confronted Ahaz, you might recall, in chapter 7. Here, the Rob Shockey is confronting Hezekiah's men. They came out to Eliakim, son of Hilkiah, who was in charge of the palace, Shebna, the secretary, and Joah, son of Asaph, the recorder. The, Rab the Rabshaki said to them, said to Hezekiah, thus says the great king, the king of Assyria. Notice the way that's phrased. Does it sound familiar at all? I mean, it has that thus says the Lord vibe going on, but it's the king, the king of Assyria. So this is, a, this is a calling out. Who's in charge here? 
On what do you base this confidence of yours? Do you think that mere words are strategy and power for war? On whom do you now rely as you rebelled against me? You're relying on Egypt, that broken reed of a staff which will pierce the hand of anyone who leans on it. They're a joke even now. Um, and by the way, they continue to be a joke. All the way through the destruction of Judah in 587, the Egyptians always lose. Such is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, all who rely on him. But you said to me, rely on the Lord our God. Is it not he whose high places and altars Hezekiah removed, saying to Judah and Jerusalem, you must worship before this altar? Come now, make a wager with my master, the king of Assyria. I'll give you 2,000 horses if you're able on your part to set riders on them. <laughs> That's just me. Isn't it? I mean, it's, I tell you what, I'll give you 2,000 horses. Think you can come up with 2,000 guys who could ride against me? You can have the horses. I'll just, now he's just taunting him with all of this. Um, how could you repulse a single captain among the least of my master's servants when you rely on Egypt for chariots and for horses? Moreover, is it without the Lord that I've come against this land and destroy it? The Lord said to me, go up against the land and destroy it. So, he's taken all the angles to go at them here. Um, the uh, Eliakim, uh, El Eliakim and Shebna and Joah have a great response to this problem. When confronted publicly by the Forest Field, by the Rob Shockey, he says, Please speak to your servants in Aramaic, for we understand it. Don't speak to us in the language of Judah within the hearing of the people on the wall. <laughs> this is great. The people on the wall understand what you're saying. Think we can talk in Hebrew or Aramaic? They don't understand Aramaic. Speak your voice down! <laughs> Basically, is his point. Well, of course, the Rob Shockey is just going to be louder now, right? But the Rob Shockey said, Has my master sent me to speak these words to your master and to you and not to the people sitting on the wall who are doomed with you to eat their own dung and drink their own urine? The guy can play a crowd. This guy knows how to work the crowd here. Uh, the Rob Shockey calls out, Don't let Hezekiah deceive you. Um, he tells the people, Make peace with me. Come out to me and everyone will eat from your own vine and your own fig tree and drink water from your own cistern. What language is the Rob Shockey using here? Is that familiar at all to you? Eat of your own vine, drink of your own fig tree. It's promised land imagery. So he thus says the great king of Assyria, I will lead you to a land flowing with figs and vines and water in your own cistern. I'm, he's directly combating Yahweh in this. The people were silent and answered him not a word. The king's command was do not answer him. So they're at least doing what the king said. So that's nice. Don't say anything. Then Eliakim, son of Hilkiah, who was in charge of the palace, chef of the secretary, Joah, son of Asaph, the reporter, came to Hezekiah with their clothes torn and told him the words of the Rabshaki. So they are mourning at that point that this has happened. Upon hearing that he has disobeyed God, upon hearing this has happened, Hezekiah heard it, he tore his clothes, covered himself with sackcloth, and went to the house of the Lord. And he sent Eliakim, who was in charge of the palace, chef of the secretary, and the senior priest, covered with sackcloth, the prophet Isaiah said. They said, thus says Hezekiah, this day is a day of distress, of rebuke, of disgrace. Children have come to the birth, and there's no strength to bring them forth. It may be the Lord your God has heard the words of the Rob Shaki, whom his master, the king of Assyria, has sent to mock the living God, and will rebuke the words that the Lord your God has heard. Therefore, lift up your prayer for the remnant that's left. And Hezekiah received the letter from the hand of the messengers and read it. Then Hezekiah went up to the house of the Lord, spread it before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed to the Lord, saying, Lord of hosts, God of Israel, who enthroned above the cherubim, you are God, you alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth, you've made heaven and earth, incline your ear, O Lord, hear, open your eyes, O Lord, and see, hear the words of Sennacherib, which was sent to mock the living God, truly, O Lord. The kings of Assyria have laid waste to all the nations in their lands, have hurled their gods into fire as though they were no gods, but the work of human hands, wood and stone, so they were destroyed. So now, O Lord, our God, save us from his hand, so that all the, Isaiah's name, by the way, uh, so that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone are the Lord. He repents. He repents for this act of disobedience. And as a result, therefore, says the Lord God concerning the king of Assyria, he shall not come into the city, shoot an arrow there, come before it with a shield, or cast a siege ramp on it. By the way he came, by the same he will return. He shall not come into the city, says the Lord, for I will defend the city to save it for my own sake and for the sake of my servant David. And the angel of the Lord set out and struck down 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians. When the morning dawned, they were all the dead bodies. Um, <laughs> when the morning dawned, they were all dead bodies. Um, then King Sennacherib of Syria left, went home, and lived in Nineveh as he was worshipping the house of his god Mizrach. His sons, Adramelech and Sharezer, killed him with the sword, and they escaped and landed in Ararat. His son, Esarhaddon, had been seized. So, happy ending. Now, they're still a vassal of the Assyrians, and Hezekiah had to pay him off to leave. Um, the Assyrians make absolutely no mention of this part of the story in the Taylor Prism. However, they went home. 
For four years, they had marched across the Middle East, and nothing had stopped them until they got to Jerusalem, and they went home. And the Assyrians were always big to do pr uh, propaganda. They always dipped their sword in the blood of their enemies, whether they won or lost. Um, but this is one example where they didn't say they didn't say they lost. They said Hezekiah paid his money, and so we decided to go home. Uh, which to me gives a lot of credence to the miraculous deliverance of God <laughs> to the story there. So, so you see the difference between Ahaz and Hezekiah. Ahaz confronted with a choice on the road to the fuller's field says, "I don't plan on putting God to the test." Hezekiah, when facing this choice to go along with the king of Assyria or not, repents and commits himself to Yahweh, and God delivers him. That, to me, sets up what's going to happen in the second half of the book of Isaiah, with the, the end of the exile, repentance that comes, that brings them back. So that's, that's, how the, that's how those two stories, for me, anchor the beginning of the book in a lot of ways. Whew! So... The date on the day of prison, is it contemporaneous? It is. After it is. It's just after. Yeah, it's just after. It's pretty pretty early. Who's going to issue by 7.15? I don't know about that. No. I know Ezra Haddon, but I don't know about that. So, didn't think I could get through 39, but I did it. <laughs> there. So, from, from this point to 40, then we have 150 years. Yes, from the end of chapter 39. Hezekiah, I didn't left off this part. Hezekiah gets sick. He's miraculously delivered. Uh, he invites the Babylonians in, figuring that the enemy of my enemy is my friend, to which the Babylonians he saw showed all the temple treasury, and they said, you know what, we'll be back. Um, and Isaiah said, what are you, nuts? And he said, he said they're going to come back, and they're going to deport the people and, and exile them. And, and Hezekiah goes, not in my lifetime, right? And he goes, no, not in your lifetime. And Hezekiah said, okay, good. Um, so that's the end of chapter 39, is Hezekiah going, whew, that was a close one. I thought that was going to be bad news. Uh, whew. Uh, and the end of chapter 39 is with Hezekiah celebrating that that's not happening in his lifetime. And the beginning of chapter 40 is 150 years later. Yeah. With no transition. So, which we will get when we end the exile. So we're not going to do the rest of that now. So, All right. Good. Rob, you said we're not back till the 18th of the December. 18th, What's going so. on in the 11th? Why? The 11th is the dinner, and dinner the, carols. the carols. The carol sing and the the dinner. Okay. So the fourth is service of consolation. The eleventh is our dinner, uh, where we sing Christmas carols and eat together. And then mm -hmm. the eighteenth, we'll be back here. And okay. then the twenty-fifth, we will not meet. Of December. No. I know, we could, but I'm not going. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, blessings. Have a great night. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to San Diego, yeah. so I will be out on Sunday. Oh, what do you think? Cindy's going to go. Okay. Oh.